We are now exactly one month away from the start of these games in Beijing. Like the last time the country hosted, the organization, the venues, the staffing will likely go without a hitch. China had impressed the world with its work on the Summer Olympic Games back in 2008, which had rolled out spectacularly. If anything, this will run even better. DW's Clifford Kunin joins us now in the studio. Clifford, you were based in Beijing during the Olympic Games last time, 2008, as was I. Uh, so much has changed since then. What kind of country was China then and where does it stand today? Well, I think what's interesting is, first of all, China hasn't actually changed that much in the interim. Uh, what you have is a lot more of China. It's, a, it's now the world's third biggest economy. It's become much more of a, a player internationally. But in terms of how the country is run, it hasn't changed that much, with the exception that we see this huge focus now on Xi Jinping. Um, and these are very much going to be the Xi Jinping Olympics, I think. And what's also changed, I think, is how the world views China. Back in 2008, you'll remember, um, everyone was looking at China with a certain amount of hope, um, expectation that maybe uh, that increased wealth um, and power would lead to a democratization or whatever in China. And I think most of those ideas about engaging with China as a way of driving change have largely been um, swept aside now by the, by the way that uh, Xi Jinping has imposed a very strict rule there. And the country is trying to aim for a zero COVID policy. How is that impacting the games? Well, this is very interesting because it could mean there's no spectators at the games, for one. Um, I saw today there's rules that, that cheering isn't allowed, um, that you can only applaud. Yeah, you so, can't expel too much, expel too much too many ox, Yeah. <laughs> um, so in some ways the games will look a little bit like the National People's Congress with everyone applauding. But um, I think the zero COVID policy, I mean, it's been very successful so far in containing, in containing um, COVID. But um, how, that's going to, how that's going to work in terms of, um, in terms of an international event like the Olympics is, is very open. Now, I want to pivot to human rights. I mean, activists, including those from the persecuted Uyghur and Tibetan minority groups, and also, of course, people who care about Hong Kong, have called for a boycott of uh, the games, sports, and politics uh, forever. There is a debate about whether you can divorce the two. Uh, I want to run two voices. Uh, the first one is from the International Olympic Committee president, Thomas Bach. Have a listen. We are not a super world government, you know, where uh, the IOC could uh, solve or even address uh, uh, issues uh, for uh, uh, which uh, no, uh, not a UN Security Council, uh, no, uh, no G7, no G20 uh, has a, a solution. Ironically, that is the same kind of rhetoric that people from China always tell me when I bring up the fact that 2 million Uyghurs are in trenching camps. When I talk about Tibetans having their lands occupied by China, all they say is it's complicated. Well, Clifford, is it complicated? There have been a few diplomatic boycotts. Uh, for example, what's the latest and does China even care about this? Well, I think what's interesting, I mean, in 2008, people were calling for a boycott as well. We had a very um, harsh crackdown on Tibetans in March of 2008, as you recall. Um, but um, people, people didn't seem to really take it seriously. I think people know a lot more about China now and how they view China has changed. Whether China cares about it, I still think that it, it wants the Olympics to be a success. And it's very important for China's um, international image that the Olympics sh should be a success. So I think they, they definitely do care about it. Uh, one thing that I'm, I'm trying to uh, think about is um, context, historical context. Uh, when have the games been boycotted um, and when have people talked about it and decided against it? Boycotts are an interesting one. A lot, some people say they just don't work at all and some people say they can actually make things happen. I mean, we saw that the boycott of South Africa ultimately led to apartheid. Um, you know, the end of apartheid um, and by isolating South Africa that way. Um, with uh, China, because of its international power, um, boycotting is very difficult because China holds a lot of the economic uh, power. So people are, are loath to, to go for a full boycott. Uh, I think boycotts can be effective, definitely. And indeed, China boycotted the 1980 Olympics uh, in Moscow, the US-led boycott. So, you know, anything they say about not politicizing the Olympics, you know, is clearly just a question of which Olympics. And that's very but interesting. It is, right? And, and I think um, and China hasn't been in the Olympics that long as well. It's only 1984 that they first 
uh, competed in any sort of significant way. So, um, but whether this, uh, whether a boycott, I think a diplomatic boycott is what we're probably going to see, but people can't just ignore the issue anymore. I think that's the big change between now and back then is that, um, you, you know, we know now what China is doing in, in, in Xinjiang and in Tibet. And so if you compete in the Olympics, you go there with that understanding. And I think that's the biggest change. Clifford Coonan, we're going to have to get you back in for a post-mortem after the Games. Thanks so much for joining us.